Well, thank you very much. So, um, you know, everybody's here looking at Scala, and, and you know, Scala is sort of this combination of, of OO and functional programming. And there seems to be, I always feel there's a lurch towards functional programming in the community. You hear more and more about that. And when you start hearing about functional programming, particularly stuff coming out of, out of Haskell, which you hear a, a lot about is categories. And, and category theory seems to be reduced to monads and monoids. And um, so I was at uh, a Scala Days a few months ago and, and remarked on that, that I hear, I hear people talking about categories, but I don't get the sense that they really understand what it is. And, and somebody said, OK, well, why don't you come in and give my group a presentation? Which I did. And um, this was sort of an outgrowth of that. I got a reasonably, reasonably decent feedback from that. So that's one, one reason I'm giving this. And I'm hoping that you know, the results you'll get, A, a little bit of taste of what categories actually are, that you could actually do some real work with them, and um, that we could actually use them in practice. The other reason is, uh, years ago when he was a freshman, my son gave me this t-shirt which says, that's all well and good in practice, but how does it work in theory? And I've, the moment he gave it to me, he said, I have to give a talk to, that I can wear that paper to. So this is that talk. So what is a category? And categories are really, you know, at one level is, is almost trivial. And you think categories have been presented as, as competitor with set theory for the foundation of all mathematics. And so a category is a set of objects, a set of arrows amongst those objects directed. So it's essentially a directed graph. Those arrows are called morphisms. Every object has at least one arrow called the identity arrow, which is an automorphism. It goes back to itself. Um, an arrow is composed. So if I have objects A, B, C, and D, they have down here, and I've got, you know, F goes from A to B, and G goes from B to C, and H goes from C to D, then, then they compose, and the composition is associative, as you see on the bottom. Um, the identity morphisms, uh, basically, you get this law up here, where if you take the identity morphism on A, on A and then follow F, that gives you, that's essentially this, that's identical up to isomorphism, which we hear all the time, with taking F and then taking the identity morphism on, on B. So on one level, I've told you everything. On another level, well, what you always get when you start reading about this is somebody says, well, what happens if you have sums? What happens if you have products? What happens if you have epimorphisms, monomorphisms, exponentials, initial objects, terminal objects, and on and on. And essentially what it is is you get what if you have this particular condition and you work out a bunch of consequences and then you're told, oh, groups are like this, monads are like this, and you're just given all these mathematical constructs that work out that way. Um, and the general idea is, and you can see this playing out in some areas you know, of, of functional programming, such as type classes and so on, is once you have this machinery, if you can take your problem and map it into this machinery, you get everything that anybody's proved about these things for free. And category theory has been called abstract nonsense. And I don't hang out in these rarefied fields, but apparently in, in, in mathematics, when, when people sort of take a big problem, dump it in category theory and say, well, therefore, this is X, Y, and Z are true, it's basically proof by abstract nonsense. In a sense, it's like if you remember when you're learning about NP completeness, and it was all like, take this problem and convert it into cliques, or take this problem and convert it into sat. Sat and cliques have absolutely nothing to do with the problem you were given, but if you can do that, then you can demonstrate that your problem is NP complete, and you can say, I give up, it can't be done. So. It, you know, this is all very similar to that in that you get this reduction and then you get the power of whatever you've reduced to. So, um, you know, the slides will be posted. You may want to take a picture. So here are three pretty good books. Uh, the David Spivak book is sort of the book I would suggest for, for people like us in the sense of computer people. The, the sort of grand classic in category theory is uh, category theory for the working mathematician. Um, this is really category theory for the working non-mathematician. Uh, conceptual mathematics. Um, oh, and, and there's a version of that. There's a PDF of that that's available online. It's also been published as a book. Uh, you can go either way. Um, the nice thing about PDF, of course, is you can wander around with it. The nice thing about the printed copy is that he gets paid for his work. Um, 
Love Your and Chanul is a very uh, easy introduction into category theory. It's you know a mathematical introduction, so it doesn't get into the programming stuff. The Awodi book. Um, oh yeah, and the the there there's. Uh, the second version, the second edition of the of conceptual mathematics is out. The first version you can get is also there's a PDF available online. Uh, category theory also there's a PDF available, or you can pay for it. That's another intro that is not easy. <laughs> um, you need a certain amount of uh, you got to be ready to to bash your head against a lot of stuff, but it's very good. Um, so. There's this huge menagerie of stuff. Oh, I should just point out one thing with this. So I mentioned exponentials here, and though I won't get into those, exponentials basically, if you have a category with exponentials, then you have the lambda calculus, hence you can do anything. So at a certain level, one can do everything that we want to do programming-wise in category theory directly. Is that what we want to do? That's an interesting question, but you could. So the, the part of the menagerie that I want to get into because I want to do certain things and this is what I need for that, are these guys. Um, products, sums, functors, fibers, which are kind of like hash tables, sort of. Uh, pullbacks, pushouts, uh, monoids, which everybody's heard about um, if you've been attending lectures, and, and free monoids, which is a generalization of the notion of a list. Um, so we'll see whether or not you can actually do anything useful with those as, as we go along. Um, so first ones, the first are kind of easy, products, and if you've learned Scala or Haskell or, or languages like that, you have tuples, and products are basically tuples. You put a bunch of stuff together, each thing is of some particular type, it's of a fixed length, and you can pull out the different pieces of it. The little picture on the right, on the right over there is how we deal with things in category theories. I mentioned before, you've got everything in category theories about nodes, essentially nodes and edges or objects and morphism, so it's one of the things that I like about it is it's all very, uh, very graphic. So a lot of stuff that goes on is you read this thing and they draw out this big crazy graph and they go, well, if you follow these lines, then you get from here to here. And if you follow these other lines, you also get from here to there. And hence, everything has been demonstrated for you. You go, oh, OK. So um, in here, we've got objects A and B. And we have this object C sitting in the middle there, which is the product of A and B. If you've got, if C is the product of A and B, then you have these two morphisms called projections, one from C to A and one from C to B. And it so happens if there is any other object floating around in your category, which has a morphism to A and a morphism to G, I mean, an anamorphism to be here, F and G, then there is a unique morphism from D to C, where this uh, diagram, as we say, commutes, which is to say you can get from D to A directly over F, or you can get from D to A through C. Now, the thing that's interesting, and talk about a bit further as we go along, is C is a limit, which is to say that I said if there's any other object, such as a D, which has morphisms to A and B, then it has a unique morphism to C, which in this case is just basically F and G. And since it's unique, that makes this a limit. And I'll get to why that's really interesting later on. So one of the other, one of the funky things you get with category theory is you can always chase, take all the arrows in any con categorical construct, turn them all around so they're facing the other way, and you get another categorical concept. Here, you get sums, and sums, well, I should have said, so products, as I said, you know, that shows up in Scala all over the place, Haskell all over the place. Sums are what you get with case classes, and particularly sealed case classes. So essentially, you've got A and B, and rather than having projections out, you have an injection going in. So that means you, you know, C is sort of either an A or a B. You have to go look inside to find out, which is, while you do the match, and if it's an A, you do something with it. And if it's a B, you do something with it. Here, C, rather than being a limit, it's a co-limit or initial, which is to say that if there's some other object that, you know, if you get from, you can get there from A and you can get there from B, well, then you can always get there from C by essentially figuring out which one you have and then taking the appropriate, uh, the appropriate morphism across. 
another big thing you have. So you're getting really fast intro to category theory. So just hoping that at the end of this you go, all right, he spoke for 40 minutes. That wasn't gibberish. There is something interesting there. Um, so a functor, so a morphism is, is an arrow between two objects. A functor is a morphism between two categories. So when you're, when you're, when you're mapping objects, and objects really can be anything. So objects can be sets, objects can be groups, objects can just be sort of random crap you find hanging around. There's, you don't have the kinds of limits. So I gave um, a lightning lecture version of this last fr on, on, on Friday because I happened to be at the Hacker Dojo on Friday afternoon and they do lightning talks there. And um, the only comment they got was, you should tell them that categories, you can have a category, you have the category of categories, which includes as a category, the category of categories, whereas sets, of course, you can't have yourself as a member. So um, categories don't have the same, same limitations that sets do, but those objects could be sets or other things. But a functor is a mapping between two categories. So you have to map the objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. Such that, love it, that diagram commutes, which means to say that you can get from A in category C to F of B in category D, either going along the top, which is to say, apply the, the functor first to get into D and then, and then take the, the um, the mapping of, of uh, morphism F, or go from A to B in category C and then take the functor across, and that they both get you to the same place. Now sometimes you have a, a, a functor going the other direction, and even sometimes you have this glorious construct called an adjunction, which I'm not going to go into, but it's beautiful. Um, a very important example of a category, of, of, categ of functors that I will pull in again and, and is really very significant in, in, in sort of looking at MapReduce from a theor theory perspective are fibers. And in the case of a fiber, you have two categories. I wish I could get down in front of it. I'm sorry that, I'm, that I have to stand here and wave. I really like to stand right in front, but uh, otherwise, if I do that, then we'd lose the mic. Um, so here, for example, on the left, you have the category of uh, of non-negative integers. And non-negative integers, you have um, between each integer and the following integer, you have a successor arrow. And then, of course, you have all the compositions of successor arrows. So you can get from zero to anything by following some sequence, you know, some sequence of arrows which all compose into a single arrow. Now, you can take all of those guys and you can um, take a functor from that to, to a category that has only two objects and which I'm calling here even and odd, but since they're categories, it doesn't matter what I call them. You have a, a morphism from each in, in each direction, and you can map, so you can take all of the, what I've done here is I've said I'm taking all the even integers, and I've put them, and I've, and I've mapped them in this functor to, to the object I'm underneath I'm calling even, and they all, they all are the fiber over even, I've taken all the odd ones and I've put them in the fiber over odd, and basically all of the successor um, morphisms from even to odd I map to G, and all the successor morphism from odd to even I map to F, and all of the even, even um, length morphisms I map down to the identity morphisms on the other ones. And that's what a fiber is. Basically, I have a functor from one category to another, and every and within the fiber over um, some object, all of the morphisms match the identity morphism, which is some automorphism on the guy underneath. And um, all of the morphisms that go between one fiber, between two fibers have to map to a morphism that go between the underlying objects. And in fact, if you think about it a bit, it's very similar to, uh, to a hash table or to, um, or to what you get in, when you do a reduce step. Uh, so almost done with, with this rapid enumeration of, of strange things, uh, we have uh, pullbacks and pushouts. Again, all you do is pull back and push out. You just, the pullback is on the left, push out is on the right. All I've done is reverse the arrows. Um, and essentially what I have, you're given, you've given A, B, and C. So I've got C down in the bottom there. I've got 
A has a morphism to C, B has a morphism to C, and then there's this object D called the pullback. And D has morphisms to A and B, and what happens is it commutes. So you can get, you can follow that, that dotted line to B, and then down to C, or you can follow the dotted line from D down to A and across, and you get to the same place. Essentially, those, those two composed arrows of upper F and then lower G are the same, as we say, up to, up to uh, isomorphism. If you have any E, and yet this is the same sort of limit thing. If you have some other object E, which has a morphism to A and a morphism to B, such that you, you also get this, this commutativity property, then you must, by definition, have a unique morphism from E to D that you can follow along. Now, here, that can be all in the categ same category. What we're going to do is I'm looking at pullbacks in, the fi in, a, in a fibered category. So D and B will be in one category, A and C will be in another category in, in, a, in a fiber. So yes? Is the morphism from E to D um, directly related to the morphism, or can be deducted from the morphism from E to B and E to A? So yeah, so if you have, so you're given F and G. If you have D to A, then you pretty much already have D to B because D to B is, is that morphism that makes it commute. So it's a, it, a morphism is not necessarily a function. I mean, it's really easy. I mean, it's really, really easy, as in one does it all the time, to think about these in terms of sets. And so you think that, oh, that's a function. But really, it's the morphism that makes this commute. And that's whatever it needs to be. So um, just a, a small side note. Uh, so you know, when you set up a category, you're basically saying there's a whole mess of crap that exists. Just there are these objects, and they have morphisms, and it all just exists. Um, if you want to actually do work with this, you're going to actually have to go from it all exists to I'm going to find these things that I want that actually do whatever it is that I really need. And so in taking something like this and going, OK, we're going to do work with it, you need to come essentially some way of executing or walking over all of this. And in terms of execution, if you think of functional programming and other things and, and, and other styles of programming where the idea is you, you express um, what you want, not how to get it, somehow you have to get from what to how. I mean, you as the programmer get to say what, but somebody designing this thing underneath has to come up with how. And what the interesting thing here is that um, you know, in functional programming, generally what, you really, what you're looking for is a fixed point or, a, or some kind of bound that you, can, that you know that if I, move, if I start moving along here, I will get, eventually get to a fixed point where things stop. And when I've gotten to the place where things stop, I can, you know, no, where nothing changes anymore, I can, I, I can stop working. So uh, recursion, you know, generally recursion, you get down to, you know, if n equals zero, then I'm, you know, then I'm done with Fibonacci or whatever. What we get in, in um, category theory are limits. You get limits, and if you can get finite limits, then you eventually, then you essentially have fixed point because the the definition of, of a finite limit of, of a limit is it's this thing that that everything points to and it has a unique morphism. So when you get to it, well, it has a unique morphism to itself and it ain't changing. So you know, finite limits give you what you need to be able to say. I've got some. I've got this you know this sort of abstract description, declarative description of a of a category, and I need to get and I want to get from this you know from this object to that object. And if I can say there is some operation that gets between them, which has a finite limit or a finite cone limit, then then I'm good because I know that what that the process that I eventually actually use to do this will terminate. So. Um, because actually, as I was doing this, I was like, okay, how the hell am I going to ensure termination? I'm like, what do I have around? And it was limits. I mean, I realized it was, you know, if I, if I have finite limits or finite cone limits, then, then whatever process I use, I can be insure, assured that it will terminate as long as I have these, these uh, finite limits. So, so a couple more things, and then we'll get into using this to an actual problem. How am I doing on time? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay, great. I'm speaking faster than I thought. 
So the thing that every so the two things that everybody's heard of are are or most people here have probably heard of are monads and monoids. Um, should be M O N asterisk D S, right? So um, I'll talk about monads slightly later on and in a bit technical fashion. But monoids are um, essentially this: you have a set M, you have an operation on that set which is closed. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, addition, addition and multiplication on integers is nice and closed. Uh, division is not. So you you have a you know you have additive and multiplicative um, monoids on on integers. You do not have a division monoid on integers. You have a division monoid on um, on rationals. Uh, so you have a set. You have an operation on it, and monoids you have you have an identity element, where you have this property where you're given given any element of this. Well, e is an element of the set, but given any other element of the set that you know, that op identity is the same thing as identity of the op that, which is the same thing as the object itself. So in other words, the identity doesn't do anything. So, um, you know, if you're in addition, then the identity is zero. If you're multiplication, the identity is one. Now somebody, you know, a couple of people have, have mentioned, uh, have said, oh, so it's just a semi-group. So just for those that, that care, um, the difference is, so, well, actually, no, look at that. So a semigroup just says I have a set and I have an, associ and I have an associative operator on it that's closed. I don't necessarily, so you know, the additive, the, there's an additive semigroup on, on positive integers, right? So the additive, the additive semigroup on positive integers doesn't have an identity because I defined it not to include zero. So that's a semigroup. Um, a monoid, it's just like a semigroup, but I added, but you have an identity. So I just, I throw zero into that semigroup, and all of a sudden I have a monoid. I still have a semigroup as well, because it doesn't say it can't have an identity. It doesn't have to. Groups add inverses. So, um, you know, so if I have, uh, as I said, you know, you can't get a, uh, you can't get a monoid with division on integers, because they don't, they don't divide. But if, um, if I say, no, I'm dealing with the rationals instead, all of a sudden, now I have, now I have a group because every, well, a group says every object, for every object A, there's another object called the A inverse. When you, if you multi, and if you, you use the operator on the two of those, you get back the identity. So groups have inverses, monoids do not. Monoids have identity, semigroups do not. There is, a, there is, given any set, there is, a, there is always at least one monoid you can form, and that is the free monoid. And the free monoid is basically um, a generalization of the notion of a list. So, uh, so take a set, and then you know take all finite lists of elements of that set with repetition, and you have you have a monoid called the free monoid over that set. The identity is the empty list because. At, well, the operator is, con is concatenation, right? Um, so you can take any, any list of things and concatenate them together, you get another list. So it's closed over the, uh, over the set of lists of the underlying set. The identity is, is the empty set. You concatenate with the empty set, you get the same set together. So that's, that's that. And um, the, the interesting thing is if you want to relate you know, sets, monoids, and free monoids, uh, for every for a set, you have what's called the inclusion function, which takes anything and puts it into the the free monoid, which is basically lists of just that object. And if you have a, a, a morphism from A to B, you you also sort of automatically get a morphism from from the free monoid of A to, to the free monoid of B. But basically, you have a list of you have a list from the set of A. You just apply F to everything in it, and now you have a list of things uh, that are in B. Um, and and you can then, in fact, get back to your underlying. You know, if you start off with the monoid and your set is a monoid, you can get back to the set by basically taking concat and turning it back into the into the the your mon your monoid. Your, your regular monoid operator, and that basically gives you your, uh, your fold or reduce, and you're back to a single item. And you can just sort of drop the list, and you're back to, uh, back to the monoid, and if you want, even back to the set. So that is um, 
category, th a tiny taste of category theory in a nutshell. Um, so now, how do we can we actually do anything with this? Actually, any any, any questions at this point? H list is a product. What? H list is a product. H list? Yeah. I, I'm not following. H list. You, in the first uh, slide, you actually define a product. Tuple is a product. H list enables you to define uh, ends and tuple. Uh, shapeless, shapeless in shapeless H list. I do not, which, which slide is that? The first slide you define a product, it says any tuple is a product. If you have like triple or... Here? Yeah. Yeah, Good. okay. Simple question, if H list is, H list from shape list is part of the product. I'm still, do you want to just stand up and point to what you're talking about? No, I'm, no, I, so sh yeah. here you define a tuple of two. Yes. Tuple of three is also a product? Yes, okay. yes. Yes, because if you have, if I mean, here's the, if you have products, and if your category has products, then then a product is an object in the category, and essentially, you know, that can be part of a product, and you can just essentially ignore the ignore the the, the uh, inner inner brace and go, okay, so I've got project, you know, the projection, the first projection P1, and then to project the second one is I project that the second item and the first item, and that gives me the second one. And I can get the third one by taking the second one and the second one, right? So I basically, it's isomorphic to I have, you know, I have finite products of any size. Not just 22. Not just 22. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> All right. So, um, so looking at MapReduce, uh, generically, um, map steps are essentially operations on a free monoid. So I've got a list of things that I've got scattered around, and I'm going to apply something to, you know, essentially apply the same thing to every one of those. And you can break that up. You know, and, and, and the reason I look at it as, as a free monoid rather than just a set is that sometimes order matters. If you're lucky, order it doesn't matter. You can do anything any way you want. But sometimes it does. So, it does, so you can't just say it's a set. I apply to anything. It doesn't matter what order I do things. Um, Reduction is essentially, you know, when you go from a map to reduce, you're, set, you, you're going to sort on some value, and then you're going to do stuff with that. That's very much operations on a fiber or a cofiber. Now, so that's the whole, the whole thing in, in, in a big nutshell. And then um, when, I gave, when I gave the initial talk, I was like, okay, let me show that you can actually do something with this. And um, I went and uh, sort of encoded um, word count in that. And then um, when, uh, when Salesforce said, go talk to lawyers, the lawyer said, that's all well and good. Give us another problem. So one thing that I'd done, which works really well in a MapReduce framework, is auto-suggest. And auto-suggest, I mean, you've seen it basically all sorts of websites have this. You know, you go to the search box and you start typing. And as you start typing, you get all these suggestions of, po of, of possible completions to, what you, to the, whatever word you're typing in. So. Um, it's fairly, fairly ubiquitous, fairly straightforward, and, and, and really very, very simple to, to do using, using MapReduce. And I said, okay, let me see how this work, how, how AutoSuggest fits into the framework. And it um, turns out that, that it, like, it's really nice. Um, so if you look at AutoSuggest categorically, so first you've got some stuff that's got your vocabulary in it. That basically is um, free more note over strings. Then um, you're, uh, you're going to throw those into, uh, into a fiber where essentially you've got, you've got two groups of things. On the top, you have sets of words. And on the bottom, you have prefixes. And what you're going to do is you're going to start off with those. And you're basically going to you treat those as a pullback. And then you're going to say, well, I've got this pullback. And it's got, um, it's got finite limits. So just make it for me. And because it's got finite limits, you can basically just say that in one, you know, make that as, as a single statement, and boom, you have it all. But what, but what I wasn't ready for that was really, really nice was basically that's how you build it out, and you end up with what you want. But if you then want to go, you mimic the operation of, of typing in, you essentially reverse all the arrows, and now you're walking through the cofiber on the bottom. So you start off on the top with, with a bunch of words, 
and you generate this thing, and then you start off in the bottom, and you walk your way back, and as you walk along the bottom, you just look up in the, in the co-fiber, and those, and those are your, your, uh, your suggestions. So, and I will now walk what I just said in, in, in far more excruciating detail. So, as I said, you've got a fiber. The, on the top, you have, um, you're going to have at each point, you have a list of strings, and just for uh, the sake of, of beating, a, beating a horse into the ground, you have the list of strings and you have an integer which is the length of, uh, of the prefix you're looking at. And the reason for that is, um, and in actual implementation, I don't even bother with that, but, but basically, um, if you have, you could have a set of words and the words, you know, the same set applies to multiple prefixes, but if you actually fix the, the you know, the length of the prefix you're looking at, then there's only one, um, one item that could be in the, on the bottom of, uh, on the bottom category that this could be applying to. So on the top you've got, you know, you've got a, a product which has a free monoid of strings, essentially a list of strings and an integer, and on the bottom, you have um, a single string, which is basically take, uh, take any of the words from the free monoid, pull off the first n, n of them, and then you've got a prefix. Um, and the functor is just that, just take the first guy and um, you know, anything in the first guy and grab zero to pi two and that's your, your slice. Right? Um, so as I was saying, oh, yeah. You, these morphisms are not necessarily functions. They need to be complete, they can be relations, they can be pretty much anything. So essentially, all that you have on the top is you're going to decrement the length of the prefix. And you know the, the set of words that you have is going to be a subset of the other words you have, which is not a function, it's just a relation. On the bottom, though, you do have a function. You're going to drop the last letter of the prefix. What's interesting is you can look at this as a pullback and you're going to walk, you know, you basically start off with, you know, we're going to throw in a bunch of words that have a certain length. You just start off with those, you can find what prefix they're over, and then you just walk along the bottom and each point, well, it just turns out that, that you, can, um, you can reverse this. So you don't really need the morphism on top. You only need the morphisms on the bottom, and you can always go back up the functor to get the uh, the thing you've the thing the 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 object that you need. Um, what's neat is, as I said, it ends up that you have limits because, of course, as you start dropping off letters off of any word, eventually you're going to get to the empty word, which whose only successor is again the empty word. So now you've got a fixed point. The operation on the top. By the time you got there, you've got the union of every word in your universe. And again, you're, you hit you know whatever you do, you've hit the end. Although basically, you only need to walk along the bottom. So, and then you know later on, you want to reverse it. You basically can start off with with that empty string and just walk along the cofiber, which essentially, as I said, just reverse all these arrows along. And as you walk along. Where every you know every letter you do, you just basically take that morphism to whatever whatever prefix you get next, and then just go back up, and you've got your list of, of suggestions. So, you know, and once uh, I was asked, "Can you give us another problem?" And I just sort of randomly pulled one that I thought was you know fairly straightforward. I mean, you know, if all designed like much more complex pipelines, but it's like I wanted one that I could explain. It was like, oh my god, it works. It's like perfect. So, I mean, that's basically the, the strategy. You generate your vocabulary, which is a free monoid over, over strings. Um, and then you have a, a functor from that to, um, to, the, to the over category. And, you know, and then, because that's, because you've got these strings, but now you look, you're dealing with another data structure. So you basically have a functor from that. Then, you know, you can build the, the rest of it by just, having the functor in the fiber, which get, takes you to, to, to the prefixes, and then just say, go, go build. And I mean, ideally, you're going to build some, you're going to create some stuff underneath that basically just builds it. Um, and then when, you know, after you've said, here, here's the stuff, go and do, uh, you just grab the, the co-limit in the co-fiber, 
right? So you start at the bottom, and then you can just walk back along the other, the other way. So that was, uh, you know, that was sort of this viewed categorically. Now the question was, how would you know that I had was okay? How can I do this in um, in Scala? And you know, if you're going to do this, you want to be able to represent the the categorical pieces, basically just operations on categories. And then you go, okay, but you know, what is it? What's actually functioning on? And you go, well, you know, you really ought to be able to. If it's that high level, you should be able to have it function. Be able to run it on Spark, run it on Hadoop, run it on you know on, on a single processor, and so on. So basically, looking at you know an embedded an embedded DSL for categories in Scala, and um, you know what I have is is essentially proof of concept, but just walk you through the way I, I wanted to do this. And what's interesting is I think this um, has echoes in some of the talks I've heard today and yesterday. Um, both in the way I did it and, and you know, the, the one of the talks this morning about uh, functional, you know, uh, machine learning and, and, and functional programming, just being able to sort of use monoids, you know, if you, get, if you can exploit monoids, if you can exploit monads and some of the stuff, that, then essentially you get stuff for free. And I think the, if, if there's value to this, you know, you know monoids and monads are, are nice uh, categorical constructs. And yeah, you get stuff for free. It will be interesting to see. And you know, having just started looking at this, and asking, of course, people to join in, join in the process, is if we look at at sort of the whole menagerie of things that you have in category theory, which is you know essentially a lot of very very smart people trying to do some very very sophisticated mathematics, building out stuff that is of um, pretty incredible genericity. What can we get? If we start taking those and go, okay, if I can map to this categorical, this categorical construct, you're not just a monoid, not just a monad, but a fiber or a pushback or whatever, push out or pull back, you know, can can we that you know can we then build other stuff underneath that gives us a lot of stuff for free? So that's the the, you know, I'm just sort of playing around with that now, but that's sort of the the question, you know, the open question for for this and, and, and anything like this going forward. So circling around to monads, um, so as we said, the morphism goes from object to object. And if you want to build, you know, what we call a categorical program is basically you start, you know, is, is a, a composition of morphism and functors and so on going from some, you're pretty much starting at some object or collection of objects that you want and getting to some other thing. But, you know, that, that would, that's basically an abstraction. Um, so you, what you really want, you want your morphisms to actually operate on real, on real stuff. So I can describe, you know, a type, but in fact, if I'm going to have it run on Spark, I want it, to, you know, I want it to actually run, start with RDDs and have RDDs all the way through. So, you know, the morphisms are, are going to be Spark methods. You basically are going to be operations on or things you do with, with, with RDDs or the various kinds of RDDs. Um, but but in here with the RDDs, you know, basically needs to represent my categorical type. So I don't just want to say RDD. I say this RDD really impl essentially implements a trait, which is you know which is free uh, you know a free monoid, or this RDD basically implements this type, which is you know a product of free monoids and and, and integers, um, or it represents a, it represents a fiber or a cofiber, which essentially is you know if, what is it if you uh, a group by you you're going to get you know either a fiber or a cofiber that's where you're going to be so um, so I need a functor from from my abstract little program to you know essentially a concrete a concrete category it should be the category of things you can do with with RDD so to get just a little more obvious uh, so I want to seal up the, my these objects in an executing category and um, given my my an abstract morphism you know say A to B on the bottom. I want to be able to basically get from, you know, I handed A and I want to get back, you know, if, if C of A is essentially an RDD, I want to get back C of B, I want to get back another RDD. So essentially, I've got what, um, what we call in the trade a Kleisley arrow, which is essentially what you got with monads, where I've got, you know, you have, you know, A to B, but you're going to, you get, you start off with an A and you're going to return something that's in the monad. So with the state monad, you know, it's going to be A to B, but you get back, 
you know, you get back this pair of, of state and B. So you basically, that's what I have here. So the, uh, the idea is that each concrete category is a monad. So in Spark, it's a monad that basically has RDDs as these sort of sealed objects in there. Um, my, op my abstract morphisms, which go from the, the categories that I'm thinking about abstractly, um, are these Kleisley morphisms that basically, you know, if I say I start off with the free monoid over strings and I want to end up with a fiber, you know, basically free monoid over strings, I'm going to end up with, with a Fi representation of fiber that's in the uh, Spark monad. Um, and it was a fair amount of work to get this to work because there's all this class tag stuff and all this crazy things that go on in there. And yeah, I probably should have used arrows. But uh, that is, um, what it is, so basically I've got these category, these, these become traits. Um, and I have the Spark category, so I've got a Spark free, you know, Spark free motor, Spark fiber, and Spark code fiber, and so on, which have various RDDs underneath. Um, they always show up surrounded by this by Spark M, my my Spark monad. Um, so what happens is, I give this 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 uh, morphism or object that's sort of, you know, categorical, of some sort, and. Um, and uh, it gets handed, I guess, handed to this thing, and it says, well, I have, you know, and it, what, what Scala says is, I have this thing that's in the Spark mon uh, monad. And everything in the Spark monad is supposed to be a thing which, which returns something in the Spark monad. But this thing you give me doesn't do that. So I'm basically, I hand it to Bind, and Bind says, this is supposed to return something in the Spark Monday. It doesn't do that. Let me look for um, for an implicit that will do that for me. So essentially, all of the mapping from these things into the monads turn, is done using implicits that are sitting inside um, the uh, the object that defines the the monad itself. So you have all these conversions. So A to B gets you know it gets injected or we just whatever they all get. Uh, Moved around in um, in the Spark mon monad with with RDDs sitting all underneath underneath everything. So um, since I think I am just at about zero, uh, you know, conclusion is basically I think I've shown there is there's this thing category theory. It um, it's this interesting math you know area of mathematics. It's extremely it's extremely generic. It's very powerful. It's a whole mess of different things. We can actually do things. We can do things of a computational interest you directly in categories. So the, the real question going forward that I don't have an answer to at this point, but it's like this is what I'm trying to figure out, is if you take a categorical point of view, if you actually program using this, what does it make easier? What can we build so that all you have to do is go, oh, it's a pullback. And I'm going to define this arrow and this arrow. I'm going to say, yeah, it's a pullback on a fiber. So all I have to do is this arrow is a functor, and this one is in the lower, lower thing. And I'm going to give you this. Now go and build all, this, all the crap I need that I can later use. How much, you know, what do we get? How much do we get? And do we get enough to make it worth wrapping our brains around, around the programming paradigm? Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for questions. No, no. <laughs> oh, if you had the answer, let me know. <laughs> Save me an awful lot of work. <laughs> you had uh, briefly mentioned adjunctions. Um, said they were uh, okay, so out of scope, but I, what's the escalator pitch? Uh, oh, so adjunctions is, um, you know, a lot, of stu a lot of stuff that we'll probably get is the notion I can get, you know, if I can get from, from A to B, and I know, well, and there's a lot of stuff I already know how to do with B, then, you know, sort of, I guess it's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of down here and I want to get from here to here, but I don't know how to get from here to here, but I know I can, how to get from here to here, and up here I can do an awful lot of stuff, and then I get somewhere here where I can get back. And um, 
then it's like, oh, I can get from here to here for free, or almost for free, because all I have to do is get, sort of, all I have to do is get from, you know, do this piece and this piece, and all this stuff up there I get for free. And I think that's a lot of where the value is, is that, um, you know, people can, do, you can take stuff that's already been done, and all you have to do is just get there. And once, you know, and once you're there, you get to take advantage of all this stuff, and then you just got to be able to, like, sort of get back. And that's what a junctions does. So the way um, junctions work, let's see. Uh, this is probably a bad idea, but I will try, but I will try it anyway. Um, so, uh, so generally they're, they're like this. Uh, where you basically, in a junction, you've got a pair of, of, of um, functors. So, and one of them is a left functor and one of them is the right functor, and it really does make a difference which one is which. Uh, a, a, an easy example is, um, is free monoid and the forgetful functor, which basically, uh, you know, that, that, that's the, mon you know, on one hand you've got the functor that injects you into the free monoid, and the other one you have the, you have the forgetful functor that basically says, I forget what you are, I'm just going to treat you with some object in the underlying set, I don't know what the operator is. Um, but basically what happens is you start off, so as I said, you know, you've got, you've, you're down there at C, and you want to get to something, but you don't know how to get there. So if you can create these two, you know, this adjunction, you basically can apply F to C to get up to the, to the upper category. Then you can do whatever, you know, you can do whatever you need over there, and you get to D, and then you can get back down by taking G back across. And if you do that, you've essentially defined the morphism on the bottom by just applying these two things and, want, and, and then taking advantage of everything that you know how to do on the top. And so, um, you know, one example of, of, of that's very close to this is um, Cohen contravariance in um, function arguments, right? Because you, you know, you're, you're going up because you can always, uh, which way is it? Yes, so you can always cast to it, you know, Substitute a function that uses a that uses a base class as the as the as the um, argument because it requires less, and you can always end up with something that's a uh, superclass because you know providing more is fine as well. So you can think of contravariance as an example of this, so that it's basically an adjunction with itself. But there's a whole mess of these, and. Um, the first time I was introduced, introduced to this, the, the book used Galois, um, Galois junctions as the example, and I'm like, I don't understand what the hell is going on. I mean, that was just like, it, it was like, you're already hitting me with, with, you know, you're hitting me with this really interesting concept that I don't understand, and on top of it, you're throwing this really, this concept that actually is twice as difficult at me as your example. Go away. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're about out, out of time for questions, but we'll uh, take more offline. Uh, Absolutely. Let's, uh, thank you, Matthew Fuchs. Thanks.